the story of King Alfred and his cakes. So here we are in a forest in Wiltshire. This is a friend of ours, Forest, who's come to help us cut down a oak tree for our wedding. So while I'm here, we've noticed some King Alfred's cakes here. These are a type of fungus that grows on dead oak and ash trees. Well, not always dead, although this one doesn't look very well. They're called King Alfred's cakes. There's a story about that, which I'll tell you in a minute. They're also called coal fungus and cramp balls. So historically, these would have been used as a magical cure for cramp. You just put them in your pocket and they cure you of your cramp. Old system of magic, that, I like that. They're also called coal fungus. That's because they're a very good fire lighter. I think the Latin name for these is something concentrica. If you cut them in half, you see they've got many, many concentric rings and they grow very, very, very uh, dry and become really good tinder for fires. Uh, these are a bit soft. They need to be quite dry. So you, what you do is you, you find these and just give them a give them a flick. And if they've got a nice dry sound, then they should be alright for tinder, and they will um, they'll take an ember really really well. So let's try and start a fire now. that's too soft you can squash it between your hands so here we are King Alfred cakes that's a good one that's nice and dry and here we have a little foraging bag Courtesy of Hugh. Thank you, Hugh. Pop them in there. That's a good one. That's a good one. See if you flick them and they make a nice dry tapping sound, then you know you've got something that will probably catch fire. This one's got a little friend living in it. Hello, little friend. Come on out, you come. Road here. There's trackways here. And through the woods there. Something's been murdered. Been a rabbit here. Not particularly recently. Oh, you just touched its shit. That one's not quite hard enough. It's a bit soft. Can you let sort of dig your nails into it a bit? That one might be a little bit soft, but might be okay.
see that? So, why are King Alfred cakes called King Alfred's cakes? This is a story attached to the life of King Alfred the Great. So King Alfred the Great was the first king of England, or I suppose I should say first king of the English. In the early medieval period, in the ninth century, Britain was a little patchwork of kingdoms. Some of them were Anglo-Saxon kingdoms like Wessex and Sussex and Mercia and Northumbria. Other ones were British kingdoms. But in the ninth century, England was under attack from the Vikings and one Anglo-Saxon kingdom after the other fell to the great heathen army that was marauding across Britain. And then finally, there was only one kingdom left. It was the kingdom of Wessex. The Vikings, they did this thing. They would take over a town and then be paid a tribute to leave. And they would leave, but maybe they would just go over the border into Mercia or something like that. And then they would return. <clears throat> so it was around Christmas time when the Danes came over the border from Mercia and attacked Alfred's winter palace at Chippenham, not far from where I'm sat now in Wiltshire. Alfred, just by the skin of his teeth, managed to escape and fled into the forest. Could have been a forest just like this one. And there he came across a little hovel in the wood where there was an old woman tending her fire. And Alfred was in disguise. He was on the run. He was a king in disguise. And she, recognising a fellow Anglo-Saxon, an Anglo-Saxon speaker, invited him in. And she gave this stranger a task. He was to look after these cakes that were cooking by the fire. These wouldn't have been sweet cakes. This would have been some kind of savoury cake, maybe sort of oats or barley mixed with animal fat, if she was lucky. And they were just cooking on the hearth stone on the fire. And Alfred's job, his one job, was just to turn those cakes and make sure they wouldn't burn while the old woman went out to gather some firewood and tinder to keep the fire going. But Alfred was a little bit preoccupied. He had just been battered by the Vikings and his mind was filled with plots on how he was going to wage a guerrilla campaign from the forest and, you know, lost, lost in these war games of his mind. He let the cakes burn and that woman came back and not knowing he was a king, scolded him and said, you're a very naughty boy. And Alfred learned a lesson of humility and he went on to defeat the Vikings in the end and went on to unite all the Anglo-Saxon kingdoms. So Alfred the Great was the first king of all the English. <laughs> so King Alfred, according to legend, was much mocked for his culinary skills. And these uh, little funguses were forever after called King Alfred's cakes. It's an interesting story because they are, of course, much connected to lighting fires. It's just like a piece of burning coal, which is why they're also called, Nero, yeah, right, shush, why they're also called coal fungus. So our hunter-gathering ancestors would have been very familiar with these. They would have been a great source of um, just natural fire lighter, but you can also transport a fire from one place to another with these. You just, uh, this, these, the, the fungus keeps the ember for a long time. So you can, if you need to move camp, you can just take your fire with you. You, you there we go. Look at that. Is that cool? That's very cool. Thank you. Come on, King Alfred. I don't have this cute one. That's so cool. Oh, that's adorable. Oh. I think anything you eat outdoors just tastes better. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. That's just a fact, isn't it? Spectacle making. <laughs> Lit cane rod making. <laughs> this is my stick. Straw working. Tanning, we're through it. That's it. No spoon carving. 
Yeah, yeah. Umbrella That's making. Brilliant. Coconut squash. Roast the roasted. No, do you want some? Oh. So you roast the roasted first, and I think that makes them a bit. Yeah. <laughs> I feel like that's gonna. Yeah. Nice <laughs> gnaw on that bone, Nero. You're enjoying that. Something's had a nibble on this femur. There's a quick two-minute tickle. Uh, Sam, you could bring your yours if you want to. Yeah. If you want to do some, um, are you going to get some? What's, what's oak like for spooning? So there's two. There'll be two, two and a half meter lengths that will still give you know decent flanks. Yeah, yeah. yeah you know, there's a crow mobbing a buzzard up here. Go crow. Go on, crow. Hit that buzzard in the face. <laughs> Stupid buzzard. I do, I find it a bit of a shame that a lot of the old folk magic that everyone just used to kind of know has been lost now. Of course, we have modern medicine, so that's in many cases a lot more effective than the old folk remedies. Not always. I mean, a lot of the, a lot of contemporary medicine comes from plants, but I suppose this thing with cramp balls putting them in your pocket, that's, that's just pure magic, isn't it? Putting a fungus in your pocket to cure cramp doesn't seem to be something that's been taken up by modern medicine. But you know, what makes me think this is interesting is, aside from the connection with the natural landscape, which is always going to be beneficial, the so-called placebo effect normally accounts for 40 to 50% of any actual medicine. So a materialist would say that's your mind doing that but the mind is a powerful powerful healer isn't it neuro-linguistic programming self-hypnosis whatever kind of words you want to throw at this one if a doctor in a white lab coat gives you a placebo a pill it's much more effective than if your mate jeff gives you a, a tic tac down the pub right because of the because of the belief uh, that a doctor is giving it to you so maybe you know a anglo-saxon witch giving you a cramp ball in a kind of ceremonial context with some words of healing. Perhaps that would actually be pretty effective at healing your cramps. So if you've been following this channel for a while, then you will know that I've told the story of King Alfred's cakes on this channel before. I told it above Wantage, which was the town where King Alfred was born. And above Wanted, there's a monument called the Wantage Monument, which is on the Ridgeway. The Ridgeway is really important to the story of King Alfred. King Alfred's Anglo-Saxon armies would have marched along this ancient trackway of myth and history, chasing the Danes who would have been marauding backwards and forwards along it as well. If you want to see my journey along the Ridgeway that I took last year with Tamsin and the dog, exploring all the mythology, folklore and history attached to this dreaming oldest road in Britain, then I'll put a link to it there. See you guys soon. Bye. Ooh.